Thank you, Michael. Hello, everyone. As uh, Michael mentioned, our project is the uh, thin analysis um, in examining similarities across legacies <coughs> that were captured throughout the 47 games editions. Um, it's, it's sorry, it's not. Oh. Apologies. So our team is the IRC Cross Evolution uh, Analysis and Evolution Team. My name is Omar Adi. <coughs> to my right, Emilio Valdez, Gia Choi, and Michelle Kutait. So our agenda today is we're going to start by introducing the topic by defining uh, legacy. What is legacy? And we'll go through our methodology on how we came up with the trends. Uh, and then we will go through the themes. Uh, that were chosen carefully by our client uh, for themes. Each one will present these four themes, and then we will go through any limitations that we face throughout this project, and then give you recommendation. And finally, we were going to conclude by connecting this project to the long-term uh, IOC legacy strategy. So very briefly, the what is legacy? We picked the IOC definition, which is says that legacy is the result of a vision, it encompasses all the tangible and tangible long-term benefit, uh, benefits that initiated or accelerated by hosting the Olympic Games. So just a brief background on this project. Uh, we are an extension of an initially started project in 2017 that in entailed uh, gathering 650 legacies in a large database called the Legacy Hub. What we did is basically analyzing cross to a cross-case analysis which is examining any break, uh, any uh, trends that we found or, or well-founded evolution that um, uh, that were <coughs> gave us some insights, uh, which would, would help the IOC uh, better plan for the legacies, uh, upcoming legacies of the Olympic Games. So, then briefly going through our methodology, we examined the database, we classified the database into four themes that we chose with the IOC. And then for each of the themes and the legacies in the themes, we tried to find uh, some categories that would give us, enable us to help us in our cross case analysis, which unlock some insights into some trends that we noticed throughout all 47 uh, Olympic games. The four chosen themes were sports for all, peace and sports, women in sport, gender equality, in sports and education. So each of one of us, we will focus on one theme and we found three major trends and we will list all the legacies, but for the sake of time, we only pinpointed two main legacies for each of the trend. So sports for all theme. Um, this theme basically encompasses all the activities that built up uh, that, that, that were initiated through the build-up or during or after the games that position sports as an essential element in society to promoting a healthy uh, <coughs> physical activity specifically to the youth. And one of the, the trends we saw that uh, the Olympic Games enabled the creation of sports initiative and programs that promoted sports as a fundamental and successful tool for healthy society and social inclusion. Now, um, the, the concept of, of integrating multi-sports events into the Olympic Games for the youth started as early as 1924. And there are multiple legacies from Montreal, Barcelona, Beijing, London, up to Rio uh, that we determined. We focused mostly on two groups of, 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 uh, of legacies. One focused mostly on youth and impact beyond Rio, which was mostly the introduction of, of new sports, here specifically rugby, to the general population. And the children's games that started in 1924 uh, really promoted the ideals of the Olympic Games to the youth. The Jeux de Montréal was one of the most notable legacies that reached over 500 million uh, participants, uh, especially youth, and it promoted this multi-sports event still ongoing until this day. Uh, Campus Olympia is another uh, great example of uh, an Olympic uh, summer Olympic program that promoted physical activity to youth and enticed them to participate specifically in those um, uh, venues that were built for the Barcelona uh, Olympic Games. Now, the impact beyond Rio, this is a, 
a very interesting case of introducing new sports. There were multiple sports that were introduced in Rio, such as volleyball, most specifically uh, uh, rugby. Rugby started in 2015, and the results they reached, they reached out, the program went beyond the games as well. It's an initiative started between World Rugby and the Rugby Association of Brazil, and they had amazing results with an increase in participation in the game of rugby of 118%. Now, our second trend is that the Olympic Games helped position sports as an essential element in society that resulted in creating governing bodies and organizing uh, foundations to further develop and promote sports and provide it to all citizens. And we have found legacies from as early as 1920 all up to Beijing 2008. Uh, most specifically, we picked two of the uh, main ones for us were the <coughs> wind sports, uh, which is an extension of the uh, Calgary um, Olympic Committee, and uh, Seoul CASPO, which is the Korean Sports Promotion Organization. Now, wind sport has a tremendous impact into the city of Calgary. They have been organizing events, <coughs> to a thousand events annually, and had uh, about, which brought 120 million of economic impact to the city of Calgary. And the total amount that was raised uh, or invested into sports, into high performance sports, was about 230 million was captured. So this further, um, this trend shows that the creation of these governing bodies that help promote, create these funds to, to help promote sports uh, uh, to the youth and, and creating those um, multi-sports events that are extending until this day. Uh, CASPO is a very interesting one, the Korean Sports Promotion Organization. Actually, Jia, one of our uh, team members, is benefiting from this program. And basically, the minister, it, it was started by the Minister of Culture and Sports and Tourism uh, of Korea and has contributed over 300 million uh, US dollars, um, which is a, to a sports <coughs> initiative, education programs, and uh, to promote and provide access to sports for all citizens, specifically in Korea. Now, the third and fi uh, final trend is that the games is a, is a time to, to raise financial resources. Uh, you see it from society, uh, private corporations, private donors, and um, these initiatives are launched in the build-up to the game, during the game, even after the game, to promote and expand the sports activities. We've seen it since Stockholm in 1912, in Los Angeles, Calgary, Vancouver 2010, with the Aboriginal Youth Sport Legacy Fund, and the uh, London Legacy Trust UK in spirit of 2012. Focusing on Los Angeles Youth Legacy Kilometer Program, this program basically uh, was an extension of the, the torch relay and raised about 10 million US dollars for every uh, kilometer that was uh, crossed. $3,000 were donated by multiple corporations, by different stakeholders, which was diverted to uh, organizations such as the YMCA and the Boys and Girls Clubs uh, of America. Lastly, the Aboriginal Youth Legacy Fund, which assisted people between the thir 13 years old and 30 years old and raised money for the indigenous population of Canada. And the total amount was raised, it was 2.5 million was invested into this program. We're gonna go to our next trend. <coughs> and theme, please support. Thank you, Mark. As our next trend, uh, theme, sorry, we have that, uh, the connection between peace and sports has been identified since the creation of the Olympic Games. Uh, IOC, together with organizations like UNESCO and United Nations, have found that uh, sports have the power to promote solidarity, help with post-conflict reconciliation, as well as uh, unite people from different cultures. And as our first trend, we have that the Games serve as a diplomacy platform that promotes dialogue, it strengthens friendship, and fosters cooperation between the, par the participating countries. This trend covers uh, additions from San Moritz to Beijing, but we'll only focus right now to, to San Moritz and Munich, which best represent diplomacy and cooperation. Why San Moritz? San Moritz was the renewal of Olympic Games after the World War II. Uh, these were the first global sport events since uh, 1936, and uh, IOC picked Switzerland because of their neutral position to hold these games. Then we have Munich 1972, where, where the Black September organization conducted a terrorist attack against 11 Israeli satellites and as well uh, one police German officer. Um, and in, to commemorate this, 
IOC together with the German government, the, the Foundation for Global Sport Development uh, decided to build a memorial to commemorate the, the victims because of the attack. As a second trend, we have that the games promote equality by dismantling racial barriers, empowering ethnic minorities as well as refugees. We cover for this trend uh, legacies from Berlin to Rio, but we'll only focus on Berlin, Montreal, and Rio to be better explain the trend. First, we have Berlin 1936 with Jesse Owens' participation. He was an Afro-American athlete that uh, at the beginning he wanted to boycott the games, but he decided to participate and became the non-area representation for the athletes. And then he also became the most decorated athlete by winning four gold medals in front of Haro Hitler. Uh, then we have Montreal 1976, uh, where it was the first participation of Aboriginals in the uh, Olympic ceremonies. Uh, for this, this trigger uh, other countries like United States and Australia to, to join the, the, the initiative. And then since then on, they've been included in the Olympic closing and opening ceremonies in the Olympic Games, as well as in teams as like Kathy Freeman participated in uh, Sydney 2000. And then we have, last but not least, uh, Rio 2016 with the Refugee Olympic team. The creation of this team helped uh, eight refugees participate and make history in the Games. And this enabled IOC to create the Refugee uh, Olympic Foundation, which is now helping more than 65 million uh, Olympic refugees. Uh, sorry, refugees around the world. As our last trend for uh, this specific theme, we have that peace, uh, that the games are a peaceful sport event that unites the entire world in a spirit of solidarity. We cover editions from Athens to Rio, but we'll focus our attention on Antwerp and Barcelona, which best represent this trend. Antwerp, uh, why? Because it was the first time that the Olympic symbols were presented in the games. The flag with the rings, the doves, and the oath was taken. These again represent our representation of solidarity, peace, and unity between the participating countries. And then we have Barcelona uh, 1992, with the, where the Olympic truth was applied. This allowed some of uh, some athletes from from countries like Yugoslavia to participate, even though war was still happening in their country. And three years later, Barcelona helped with the reconstruction of uh, the city. Uh, yeah, the city is affected by the war. And then we have women in sport and gender equality, which Gia will present. So even though there are many challenges to be addressed, IFC has been making a great progress in regards to promoting gender equality and uh, women empowerment. I will mention three trends that supports, best supports this uh, theme. So trend one is that the games have played an important role in gender <laughs> equality and equal opportunities. And this was actually established by us going through the numbers of all 46 editions of the Olympic Games from Athens to Rio. The modern um, Olympics in Athens were exclusive only for men. Uh, women were allowed to participate for the first time in Paris 1900 Games, and since then the times have changed. This is noticeable in terms of continuous editions of women's events in the Olympic program, as you can see from the chart. Uh, tennis Paris to rugby in Rio. Um, creating a greater access for female athletes to participate in the Games. And this is really well supported by the increase in number of women competing in the Olympic Games across the years. As you can see from the charts, there was an increase from 2.2 all the way up to 45.5%, narrowing down the gaps between men and women participating in the event. Trend two is about changing the perception and breaking down gender stereotypes. Uh, from legacies in Stockholm to Torino, I will mention about Women's First with Olympic symbolism, as well as Amsterdam 1928, where the public acceptance of female athletes have been changed. So Olympic First creates history. Um, from Cortina to Torino, we have um, representative uh, female athletes um, swearing the Olympic oath for the first time, lighting the cauldron and carrying out the Olympic flag. In the early years, um, it was commonly agreed that women should only take moderate exercise to stay fit and bear children. And due to this notion, even though they were able to take part in the Olympic Games since 1900, um, they were allowed to participate in five track and field and artistic gymnastics for the first time in this specific Games. And this has led to changes in the perceptions of sporting female body that females are as capable, as athletic, 
and powerful as the male counterparts. The next trend is about advancement of gender equality and women empowerment. Uh, besides the legacies that are mentioned on the screen, we actually expanded out to get some external facts uh, relevant to the IOC to kind of complement the legacy database that we have. From here, I will mention Antwerp's emancipation of women's, women through swimming and one IOC fact that uh, complements the trend. So this is an American case. We have Charlotte Epstein who have fought the right for the women to swim and also uh, did a bathing suit reform to enhance the performance of women. And we have her protege, Gertrude Adele, who was the first woman to swim across the English Channel and established a new record at the time, beating five men who have competed before her, creating a huge statement in regards to women's capabilities in sports. Since then, um, the sole remaining difference between men and women's swimming event were the longest freestyle from 800 meters compared to 1500 meters in Rio. However, this will change in the upcoming Tokyo 2020 games where they will feature this event to make it equal. Last but not least, uh, the IOC has been making a great effort to increase their female representatives in its own decision making positions. Recently, they made an announcement of the composition of IOC commissions where they have selected two new female chairs making up 47.7% of the positions within the 30 commissions that they have, from 45.5% in 2019 and 42.7% from 2018, showing a gradual year-on-year -year progression towards gender equality. Next, we have sport and education. <laughs> the same process here, we have three trends. The first trend is about Imp uh, improvement of elite sport athletes <coughs> and development of the uh, whole of sport in the society. For this trend, we found lots of good legacies, but we're going to focus on two. Uh, they are quite old ones. Uh, one is the sports school in uh, Cortina and Rome. They are like 60 years old now. And another one is in Munich, the Federal Institute of uh, sports science. Both of uh, these two entities are developing uh, program training for executives, for staff, and to in order to help and increase, improve the elite sport athletes. The second trend is that education is, uh, is allowed to create uh, academic entities. Uh, there, there are some academic entities in different uh, host cities and we found that the most figurative ones is uh, one in Athens, the international master programs, and another one is in Russia, uh, Russian International Olympic University. They are competitors of ASTS, but we are still the number one. <laughs> the third trend is that the Olympic Games are used as a tool to develop programs for education uh, for use people. We have uh, all these programs. They are a very good trend, this one we can see clearly. And um, for us, we found these two examples. One is Get Set program in London that involved more than 6.5 million uh, young people. They, there, there was lots of activities and initiatives from the organizing committee. And another one, beside of the programs dedicated exclusively to uh, education, we found that some Olympic museums are <laughs> developing programs to get uh, students in there and uh, promote the Olympic value. But it, it's very specific for schools, as Lake Placid Olympic and the museum in uh, CU. Uh, as a limitation for this project, we have three uh, limitations. Some overlapping of legacies across the teams. <laughs> Some uh, legacies could fit in different uh, teams. For example, the Katy Freeman could be peace and women in sports. Uh, legacies captured are different from each uh, edition. It's normal because it's different cities, different places, different contests, different times. And uh, some discontinued legacies that we have to just avoid to, in order to uh, make this trend possible. For recommendation, because we did all this process, we would suggest to extend this cross-analysis to different teams as sustainability uh, 
human skills and innovation and technology. Could be a very good idea. And as a conclusion, the trends itself are our specific conclusion for this work, but we have a general conclusion that is aligned with the introduction. Uh, one of them is the legacy shapes, uh, sorry, the trends could shape new and future legacies. Uh, the second one is uh, better communicate uh, for a bidding process, better communicate about trends and uh, which kind of legacies should be uh, involved in this new uh, Olympic Games. And the last one, the celebrate legacies, maybe in order to make different partnerships and to understand better uh, the legacy, the benefits for the whole society. That's our presentation. We uh, appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.